I'm John Wollescroft. I'm Brian Connington. And I'm Lane Wollescroft. And, and we're, we're the, the Cinema, Cinema Psycho, Psycho Show. Show. We're here with Critical Thinking Podcast. Thinking shit through one podcast at a time. What's it? Did my stomach noise just go in? <laughs> <laughs> I saw that for a minute going, I was like, no, what I heard was it sounded like um, kind of like when wind goes through a cave. That, that kind of <laughs> that is what it sounded <laughs> like on this. It did. Oh my god! I swear, I, I, it sounded like that. I heard the same thing, and I was just like, "Was that my stomach?" <laughs> the guy was like, "Dude, are you hungry? It was. I want to eat once today." <laughs> We're just producing out of a cavern. I mean, come on. No, dude, have you tried to get sticky off a pleather? Oh, well, I see what you're saying there, yeah. That yeah. shit never comes up, no matter how much you clean it. <laughs> hey, what Kyle and Miguel do on their free time is none of our business. <laughs> Which is going in on the intro. <laughs> right, here we are, busting their balls, and they're not here to defend themselves again. They didn't come, I mean, hey. <laughs> so it's open or maybe season. they did. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another exciting episode of Critical Thinking Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle, along with my co-host, Rick the Rizzo, and our other co-host, Sean. And the other Mexican in the room, Miguel G. And this is a critical look at all things gaming, movies, collectibles, and so much more. Welcome everybody to the Critical Thinking Podcast. We will have the Cinema Psycho Show on later in the episode where we interview them and have a good time doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Like, so anyways, how was your weekend, Josh? Um, I don't even remember it at this point. <laughs> it is a blur. It was a great weekend, guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I spent some time with uh, family. I'm a, so, I mean, I basically kind of pulled a Miguel here, even though I am here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I spent some time with some family. Uh, did that last night. Did a little bit of that today. And that was pretty much mostly it, other than losing some time, you know, while sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> Lost an hour, hour of time because we sprung forward. I hate that shit. Every time it's like, God damn it, I lost an hour. My schedule's bad enough. Like, why? Why do we have to have well, the this? The fall's nice when you gain an hour. That's true. But get this, they actually, they are talking about at least we're going to be in another one of the states. They, they, I don't know if it's us, but I know Florida's doing it. And a lot of people have been putting a debate for that Texas be another state that we just stay at. Stay at one and not stay at, adjust. Stay at one instead of springing forward every time we just stay the other one. Well, okay. technically, if I remember right, it was, it was the only reason it was even invented was to like save candle wax back in like the days of no, like Benjamin Franklin. So much, it's not so much candle wax. It's more to adjust with the changing of sunrise and sunset. It, it was originally more for like farming type of thing because keeping track of time. But okay, so the boring answer. But all right, <laughs> I thought yeah. it, I, we were going to go with saving the whales. But okay, <laughs> we were saving the crops. <laughs> no, I mean it's one of those bullshit things that doesn't make sense anymore, and um, it really annoys me that we still do it. I'm like, what we need to do is just at one point adjust thirty minutes and then leave it. Yeah, there, there's a careful balance between tradition and just why the fuck are we doing this shit. Yeah. What's actually interesting is if you try and look up like time zones and timing, like from a programming standpoint, it gets insane. Because there's like certain parts of Arizona that don't follow it. There's um, countries that don't follow anything around them. It, it's god awful. There's a YouTube video on it uh, done by computer file that talk that they go through every little bit, almost every little bitty thing. And it's like why you don't want to program time zones yourself. Just use the shit that's already. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's already gone through the headache. <laughs> so how was your weekend, Sean? Oh, uh, well, my weekend was uh, spent with a lot of gaming for one thing. Like I spent an entire uh, Saturday just playing uh, Shadow of Mordor. Just and why aren't you recording all day. this to put it on the YouTube channel? <laughs> because my internet doesn't work very well. Like it doesn't like to record shit. You no, know, no, it doesn't, you it doesn't do it. it. I'm not talking about Twitch. I'm talking about capturing. Oh, it capturing it locally. Then we can upload it 
Oh, well, I don't know. I mean, to me, it's like whenever I see people doing the gameplay stuff, I always think of it as it's more when it's more personal and somebody's really talking a lot and doing a lot of that kind of stuff that makes it more entertaining. When I'm like playing a story game, I'm not going to be talking. You know, I'm not, I'm going to just be watching the game. Like I'm, I, it's like I'm not even there because uh, I'm getting immersed in the Lord of the Rings experience and digging into the story and, and looking at every item I just picked up and seeing the descriptions and the background. And I, I'm a hundred percent completion kind of guy when it comes to those games so yeah it wouldn't be a lot of fun for people unless i then did the editing on this too and was like cutting out the interesting parts that i played so it's like yeah wouldn't really work but uh i'm just trying to expand the show a little bit (laughs) yeah thank you for expanding my uh (laughs) my duties (laughs) but uh i mean we could get rick into editing (laughs) that was pretty much it mostly i did that and um same thing as you josh you know spun a lot of time with the family and just you know Watched a bunch of different movies, a bunch of different cartoons. Anything was over here, over there. Uh, no, nothing of particular interest. You know, it was really just kind of like some uh, older stuff, you know, back from the 90s, some throwback things. And, you know, just had a good time with the family. That's pretty much it. Uh, as for me, I started watching Jessica Jones. Season I'm already, two? Season two. I'm already like about five or six episodes in already. Is it as good as the first season? It's getting interesting. It's a. Uh, it's not the whole thing with Kilgrave this time. It's more or less it's finding how they how she became who she is, and this this is how it's going, and it's getting d- pretty deep on it so far, and <laughs> uh, yeah, I mentioned that I did get Dark Souls three, and I did download Bloodborne, and you're right, I hate y'all guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've I've gotten more into the Bloodborne playing that one. Then I have Dark Souls. I mean, don't don't get me wrong. Dark Souls. The intro was like, oh my god, this is a like all oh, epic kind of looking. And then when I started playing, I was like, I'm, I'm not feeling it, you know. And I got to like I was talking to Josh before the show started. I was all like, I got to a point where I'm like, I do I want to pull the sword on this guy? Can I just go past this guy and just keep going? Because I pull it ends up now I'm stuck trying to fight this this thing so i'm all like should i start over and do this again or you can or you can just look up a completion video on how to actually <laughs> defeat him and then just keep going <laughs> and then when i play bloodborne i, I kind of got more into it a little bit but like i said i was like i said talking to josh earlier i'm here playing going i got pretty far i was like yeah and then once i got you get the you know the attack forms and everything which i found out bloodborne and dark souls 3 are made by the same company hence why the controls are the same Exactly. And so I was like, oh, I got this down. So once I, I got it going, then I messed up one little mess up and I died. And I was like, oh, and I was like, holy shit. I was pretty far. And I was like, it's going to start me way at the beginning where I start off. And then here comes me back alive. And I'm like, son of a bitch. <laughs> fuck this shit. I quit. I, I'm done. <laughs> yeah. I said, fuck this. And I turned it off. And I turned it off. I went and I started playing Fortnite. And I was like, yeah, and it, you know, I know, you know, I do upload some of the videos, but I end up uploading Fortnite where I'm dying half the time where I'm only in there for like two seconds. I jumped in. I was like, yeah, it's poof. all right. They found a gun before I did. <laughs> <laughs> took me a while to start learning to level up. My nephews were playing with me. So it was me and them playing and uh, we were taking turns. But Fortnite's starting to get interesting for me. Now I'm starting to understand it more, starting to get a little bit more into it. And that's what I've been playing a lot of. Because I got frustrated with Dark Souls. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, if you're talking about like uploading Fortnite videos, what you do is like show that first one of where you die, and then it's like several attempts later. later. <laughs> 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 uh, what's also what's pretty awesome is that this Tuesday we're upgrading my internet at my house, what so I might to? build. We have the AAT. We're getting the fiber wire now. Nice, dude. So we actually, I actually could be able to do. I can do Twitch. Through my PlayStation with this as fast as internet could be. Nice. So critical thinking podcast. Twitch video is coming up soon. <laughs> well, once I'll be able to do that, everybody can log on to, to watch us play Twitch live. I don't have to get a camera so I can actually put it, you know. This is another reason we need GoPros. Uh, there we well, go. The PlayStation also has a camera for itself so I can actually put me on it. Oh, okay. Like that. And, uh, and then if we all join in, I can actually put us all on it that way too. And then coming up this coming up weekend, I will be going out of town for a family vacation. So I'm going to try to get as much production as I can, but I know our next show next week is on Monday, and we will be inter- interviewing Anson Mount. 
Which means you can't be late, Sean. The Black Bolt. <laughs> no, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll come here the previous night, sleep in my van, and just wait all day until it's like time to record. So it's like just sitting on the laptop all day. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we'll, we'll have that interview with him next week. Uh, other than that, that's how my week's been and everything. So how's yours, Miguel and Kyle? Wow, you guys are really fucking boring. <laughs> hey, that's no longer the boring one. <laughs> well, we know, we know. Kyle, I think he was working, hence why he wasn't here. Uh, Miguel, he's he, he was spending time with his family. He went to San Antonio and went to Big Lou's to get that big fucking pizza. That that was insane, dude. I mean, I'm, I'm a fat guy. I'll eat some stuff, but. That pizza was overkill. I what do you, what do you say? Like ninety seven dollars? Ninety three bucks, I think, is what he said. Yeah. God damn. Yeah, I uh, I went there last year. We got it last year, and uh, we. How many pieces you eat? I could have gone for about three or four, but everybody was like, "No, you don't need any more." I was like, "I'm hungry." <laughs> <laughs> One hundred one Dalmatians, <laughs> like Rolly reference. <laughs> uh, other than that, I like, guess that's been my week. And uh, wow, you actually remembered his name. Yeah, <laughs> I'm hungry, mother. Really, I am. <laughs> wow. Uh, all right. Well, let's we'll go ahead and move on. Let's get our box office numbers here real quick. Okay, box office numbers for March 9th through 11th, brought to you by Uncanny Comics, located here in Rosenberg, Texas, on Avenue I, by Joseph Kano, our wonderful, beautiful, magnificent sponsor. He's a great guy. I'm not drunk. Moving on, we have yet. at the be- <laughs> yet yet, but that will be edited. <laughs> at number one, we have the Black Panther, which is weekend grossing at forty one million, and they have a total gross of five hundred sixty two million. Now take take for granted this is the national, this is the American market, oh, this is were, international. Yeah, they broke the billion mark. They they broke the billion mark just the fuck out, and it's week, week four. four. Yeah, yeah. So damn, they 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 did. Fantastic. Any comments? Their digression rate isn't that high either. I mean, they, it's like they they might lose about four or five million a week, but they're still staying up there with the big numbers. Still like I mean, double 41, digits, you know? yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, hell, a wrinkle in time, which is number two, is on its initial week and is only at thirty three. So yeah, that is the second one. Is a wrinkle in time, which is another Disney production. Which I heard it bomb. Yeah, I've heard it. Looks like it. Negative. Looks like it. Did, any um, of you guys, did either of you guys see it? I didn't see it. Uh, I was a little bit interested because I was I was interested in you know because I had read the books, so I was like, I wonder what they would do with this in a movie. And I was interested in some of their actress and actor choices. Like I think it was uh, didn't they have Oprah? They had oh, Oprah Oprah's in this in one, it. so I was Chris like, Pines huh. In it. I, I kind of thought just because Oprah's in it that like I think a bunch of people are going to show up because she's got like her own freaking cult, you know. Yeah, so because it's Oprah, but apparently that didn't pan out right. Apparently not, you know. Apparently uh, having your own religion named after you isn't enough, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> to get a box office hit. But uh, moving on to number three, we have Strangers Pray at Night, and I have no idea what the fuck That's was the that. That's the one that y'all y'all really pound the shit out of it, and y'all really diss the hell out of it during trailer talk. It's the one where the the people were in the trailer house, and then the people were harassing him with the mask on. Oh, the jackal looking mask shit. And the, the, oh, that 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 shit that that people that they've done like year after year, over there's, and over and there's over. There's been like one movie at least every year that does that. Okay, absolutely, yeah. So they uh, they pulled in the ten million total grossing ten million because it's their first week out. Um, we don't know what their budget was. If they're a low enough budget, they might either be well within range of profitability or, you know, might actually, you know, even have their budget. But uh, this style movie, I think they might have their budget already. Yeah. So as as a as a box office success for their budget, it's probably decent. You know, we're not really sure. But uh, none of us were excited about that. So <laughs> <laughs> moving on from that shit, we have number four being Red Sparrow. Which we have a weekend gross of eight million. We have a total gross of thirty-one million, and it's week two. They're on a budget of sixty-nine million. So, ouch, yeah, ouch, that's a big ouch. Yeah. That is that is a terrible, terrible fall from grace in that one. Like, ugh, you would have thought Jennifer Lawrence would have carried a little better than that, but maybe people are tired of her. I don't think it's people are tired of her. I think it's people are tired of this premise. Uh, the, this whole somebody's forced into a certain type of situation and then they basically have to fight their way out. 
this is another one of those that's semi overdone. Mm. I mean, this comes back to the whole, they're not creating anything new. This is regurgitated garbage at this point. That could be uh, bad news for Disney with uh, Black Widow. Maybe that would actually be their less successful production because that's basically the story. I mean, this is like Black Widow off color, off brand. Yeah, yeah basically. Maybe that's why it went bad because they were thinking, oh, they should have done it, just called it Black Widow instead of having her do this. Yeah. You might be right. And, you know, again, it probably also is timing too because, like, what the fuck does Red Sparrow have to do with, like, March and February ish range? But like, you, and also that's look at more this. of a winner. You gotta look at this too. They can't use Black Widow because look who, who made the movie. What studio? Oh, Fox. Black Panther. Yeah. Good point. Fox. Fox made it. Yeah. So. Fox made that. Yeah. Absolutely true. So who knows? Maybe it's their own. Who approved the screenplay? <laughs> <laughs> Who, who gave this the green light is the question. Maybe they were trying to get ahead of Disney doing Black Widow. Steal or thunder or something. Who but knows? That doesn't work. I mean... I don't know. Hard, hard to say. It, it never does work. I mean, you, you really can't just beat Disney. You have to take a different niche, you know? That's, that's not going to happen. Yeah. Number five, we have Game Night, which was a WB production. They are pulling in 7900000 this week, and they're... Total gross is forty five million on a budget of thirty seven. Week three, so not a fantastic game, but they did beat their budget. And maybe on the international, they might have done better than that. Yeah, I think this might be better international wise and DVD sales. This is one of those that's going to sell a lot DVD wise. I think. Yeah, I, I think you're right too. It's more of a red box and rental kind of a thing. Maybe streaming services if it gets up on like Netflix or whatever. Yeah. But yeah, I think I think maybe uh, our last guest Max. Maybe his premise is right on that. Maybe it was geared more towards a little bit more of an international, like a yeah. UK feel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and but, then look at that. We we bashed the hell out of the, the trailer on Trailer Talk. What, Hurricane Heist? On Hurricane Heist. And it's <laughs> only number eight on its debut. Only made three million weekend out. Mm. Oof. Oof. That's painful. I'm, I'm going to be surprised if they make their budget. Yeah, I'm gonna be surprised. This was a horrible time to do like an action B movie. Horrible, horrible. Yeah, yeah. it's March. If they didn't May, I mean, it, I May would have been better. I don't know, bitch. Look, Jumanji. Jumanji's already in DVD sales, and it's number ten. It's still in the top ten. Yeah, it's it's still Wait, it Jumanji's is still hanging there. DVD? Well, the digital, the, you can get the digital already. Holy shit. It yeah. is still... In, oh, wow. wow. Yeah, week 12. 12 weeks, still in theaters, still in, in at the 10th spot in the box office I hits. Mean, greatest Showman, 13. <laughs> week 12. That's true. That's true. They're still hanging in there, too. So, man, some, some good movies actually do well, actually do hang in there, you know? So there's a little bit of hope for everybody I mean, there. Look at The Shape of Water. They're number 12. Yeah. And that's 15 weeks in. Yeah, that's true. And it looks like overall they've they've been a slow gainer and they've they've held and they've sustained their play. So So that should make an okay profit, I think. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we're looking at a cult classic. Who knows? Yeah. Then we got Gringo at eleven. Do we watch a trailer for that? We didn't watch a trailer for that one. Uh that one they, they really didn't uh on that case I'd say they didn't what do you what do you call it? Market they didn't market it well? Yeah. Yeah. Because that's when with Charlie Staring and they have a company, they send a the their their black person to go, I guess, promote something or whatever. And he gets kidnapped and he calls, and he goes, I've been kidnapped. And they're like, oh, okay, uh, hold on for a minute. They're just, just, they're just taking it as a joke. And it's, and it's legit. <laughs> oh, <God>. Wow. <laughs> so, so kind of a comedy. Yeah. Eh, I mean, comedy, this dark, comedy? dark comedy. Dark comedy. Eh. I don't know. Maybe if, um, nah, maybe, maybe February, or January, like, Valentine's dark humor kind of a thing might have worked, but dude, nah. a lot of these movies are just horrible timing. They are, they really are, you know. And I think maybe that's showing how hard pressed they are to fill in the good spaces and time versus the other, you know, movies that are just killing it out there. Disney, <laughs> Disney, Fox, you know, <laughs> Warner Brothers. <laughs> all right, uh, all right. Now we're gonna move on. We're gonna go to our interview with the Cinema Psycho Show, right? Psycho Show. Did yes. I get that correct? Psycho Show with Brian and, like I said, I didn't hear you earlier. So, what was your names again? John and Lane Willis Craft. Try not to do that male thing and, and speak for you. I appreciate and you. This is my wife. She was my <laughs> <tell> her, <too. laughs> ah, I appreciate the- that. <laughs> 
the caveman thing going here. <laughs> That's right. Ugh, me and wife. Where's my steak and blue job? <laughs> oh. <laughs> so much John, even though we just met our new friends. <laughs> it's like, we got to know you really well today. <laughs> no whiskey in his pocket tonic. What do you mean? <laughs> what? <laughs> and that's our show <laughs> so guys you want to go ahead and give us a little bit of, about y'all show and everything how y'all yeah so uh our our show is is kind of we like to say that it is the vulgar yet smart uh movie news uh filmmaker interview and critique show um so it's kind of like that that middle ground between uh, you know, film snobby snobs and drunk people watching movies. <laughs> and uh, I like to say that you'll enjoy our show if you like listening to horrible people talk about movies. There's that too. That sounds like us. <laughs> that like us. <laughs> wow, we got got to learn from some of those taglines there. <laughs> well, we can't do the drunk tagline anymore, sadly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Somebody, but oh fuck you, Josh! <laughs> fuck you, Josh! Something happened. <laughs> that is not going on the record. <laughs> that fine. is struck from the record. <laughs> hey, there's a reason they don't let me in Chuck E. Cheese anymore. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wait, okay, I've got to hear that story. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh. What's going on? Oh, you actually oh. wanted to know why he's not allowed in Chuck E. Oh, that was bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And you, probably because I don't have children. That's what they're doing. You're, you're also not 12 anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sir, sir, get out of the ball pit, sir. <laughs> sir, this is the third time this month. God. Wow. Oh. Okay. <laughs> no, no. I don't know. After that Demogorgon comment, I'm a little frightened. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so you guys, how did you really get started in the world of podcasting? Because I know from a little bit of research I did on you guys, you're into the indie scene, and uh, you've done your own indie films, you've been involved in production and everything. What was it that got you guys thinking, we need to podcast about cinema? You want me yeah, to you can go say it. Uh, well, uh, yeah, well, Brian uh, actually approached Lane and I. We all went to graduate school together um, here in Pittsburgh, it's where we um, you know, initially met. And we worked on productions together, and it was at a point where we thought, okay, we ramble about everything about films all the time anyways. Why, why don't we actually find some kind of vehicle to <laughs> put this out there? And, you know, we said, let's just try this. We'll start kind of developing topics as we go. And before long, we had developed the structure for the show, and now it's, you know, pretty much a well-oiled machine. You know, we have about five different – uh, topics that we do and um, we kind of you know got that structure down and we make sure that we hit like at least one of the episodes you know um, you know if we haven't done an interview in a while we'll make sure we get that in you know or we haven't done a uh, you know a pantheon of other shit which is our terrible movies we make sure we fit one in so we uh, yeah it was just to kind of vent our feelings on on movies in general and uh, I already had a podcast. Um, I do the uh, the Super Serials show as well, which is about um, books from childhood, so like Goosebumps and Animorphs and Sweet Valley and all that stuff. So I was already um, working on a podcast at the time. And when the guys asked me, I was like, I don't know, guys, two podcasts sounds like a lot of work. And I mean, it's awesome. But I mean, we we take it very seriously. You know, we record every week. Just like you would show up to a job, you know, the only time we cancel is when someone's sick or something like major is going on. Like we don't just, you know, wake up on Wednesday and say, eh, I don't really feel like it today. You know, we know usually that we're recording every week no matter what. Right. We've we've definitely found, too, for us that uh, it's, it's definitely the consistency and it's it's knowing, you know, we're doing this every week. It really. Whoa, what's going on here? What's going on here? You are interested in the unknown, the mysterious, the unexpected. We just create. We just okay. We just brought a commercial right here for their podcast in the middle of our podcast. Sweet, that, that's brilliant. Whoa. We're gonna keep that. <laughs> it's us. Like, it should, every ten seconds, you should just play. <laughs> It'll just be on a perpetual running loop the entire episode. <laughs> yeah, dude, just make it background music for like the whole episode. <laughs> <laughs> oh god, not that. Subliminal messaging. 
There we go. We'll, we'll have it really low and we'll change frequency and we'll have it repeat throughout like different segments and parts of the podcast. Yeah, it's going to fuck people over so much. They're going to be thinking, I just can't stop thinking about this cinema psycho show for some reason. That's cool. It'll be, the, it'll be like the psychological warfare they do in Waco, you know? <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. But uh, yeah, as I was saying, uh, definitely, you know, we, we found the same way. It's, it's the consistency and, and really, I mean, it's, it's just a lot of fun to be doing the same thing, you know, together every week. And, and you, you do get like a process put together. So for you guys, what is your process kind of like as you get to your shows? You know, what, what do each of you, the roles you kind of take and how you produce this thing? Well, um, when it first started out, uh, basically like i i was pretty much coming up with the episodes uh but as we've gone forward we've kind of delineated responsibilities so john will come up with our episode kind of calendar for the whole year and it it takes advantage of specific holidays so like we've got saint patrick's day coming up so we're going to be doing leprechaun a whole review of it pantheon of other shit leprechaun <laughs> so I, I mean you know we look at at how, what movies are going to fit with that what movies are coming out that might be worth uh reviewing and we try to keep it so like with popular movies we try to give everyone like what is it about two weeks before we actually review it because we we can't do spoiler free it's just not possible for us yeah uh, um, yeah we have the same problem here yeah, so it, it's like, how am I supposed to get into the nuts and bolts of the movie if I can't talk about, you know, uh, the the whole structure of it? So, well, if we talked about it for fifteen minutes, maybe, but we got about an hour to yeah. fill. How are we not going to get into spoilers? You know? Yeah, so we we generally lay out the episodes that way. As Lane said, we record uh, once a week, usually Wednesdays, or or in the case of just before you guys start interviewing us um, today, so uh, Sunday, so. Uh, we do that, and then I basically go through and edit it. And you know, editing it is is uh, definitely the most time consuming. That and you know, you guys probably know this from running your podcast, the marketing side of it. You know, all the social media and all that stuff. So that's that's kind of how we handle it. Yeah, Brian does all the heavy lifting. You know, we we <laughs> and look pretty. You know. <laughs> Wow, I I, feel, I definitely feel a camaraderie with you, Brian, because that's pretty much describes down pat what I have to do. <laughs> well, you don't do the social media side though. That's all I do. Guy. Instagram. Uh, true. I do the Instagram. Miguel does do the Twitter, and Rick does handle the Facebook. So I don't have to do all the social media. So that's really good. That's definitely good. But yeah, the editing consumes a lot for sure. Yeah. The best way to break it down is we're all the brain. Brian's the soul. Lane's the heart, and I'm the balls and asshole. <laughs> and paint. Yeah, That's no, a new one. You're not the taint, too. But nobody cares about the taint. Everybody <laughs> cares about the taint. A generous <laughs> lover cares about the taint. <laughs> the nacho. The nacho ass. Oh, nacho. oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh. Damn. So, uh, okay, we'll shift gears a little bit here. So, what for you guys, what is kind of the categories that you love most in movies? What are the movies that you really love to go to, that you love to examine, that kind of make each one of you really tick? Well, I I would say not to just be so open-ended and political about it. Like, well, I tend to like them all for different reasons. Um, but, you know, I, I like to go to movies that I think are going to be shitty. And now, thankfully, with something like Movie Pass, like, I can afford to go to really crappy movies or, you know, the popcorn movie or the art house movie or movies that I'm, uh, well, I have no idea if that's going to be any good or not, like Annihilation, which was decent enough, actually, now that I have seen it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I like to go for a variety of things. It's not like I live for only the comic book movies or, you know, or, oh, I only go to movies that are about gay robots who <laughs> <laughs> learn about love. So it's. Yeah, a little all over the map for me. I mean, for me, I I love horror movies. That that's my bread and butter right there. Um, I love comedies, superhero movies, action movies. Um, I I have an affinity for awful but awesome movies, and my wife sometimes gives me shit for it because she'll see we're reviewing a movie for a pantheon of utter shit. And she's like, why are you consistently watching these bad movies? And my philosophy on it is. You have to, uh, uh, you know, eat the hamburger, the gross ground beef, to appreciate the filet mignon. 
So that's kind of how I equate these awful but awesome movies. But that's the whole point is that they're so awful that they are awesome, though. Ab- absolutely. Um, and then uh, for me, I, I tend to like the um, higher fantasy and science fiction kinds of films. Um, I really I really like um, also when kind of the ordinary is thrust into that situation. Um, I am bring to mind uh, the movie Wrist Cutters that came out in the early uh, to mid thousands uh, where they're in hell and it's just like here only a little worse, you know? So um, I tend to like those kinds of elements. I think that's why I liked uh, black Panther so much because it did have almost kind of like a fairy tale slant to it. Um, And also I've loved star Wars since I was 11. I, uh, when John and I got married, I don't think he realized that he was marrying a bigger Star Wars nerd than himself, but he totally did. <laughs> we found the biggest nerd of the group. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I, I read the novels like before they were like canon. Yep. So yeah, biggest nerd. Wow. So you read the good stuff before they axed all of it. <laughs> right. Thank you. I'm so pissed about Solo because the trilogy that came out in the 90s was way better. Before the house of the mouse destroyed them all Fahrenheit 451 style. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there, there's a nice inflammatory topic. So what do you guys, what do you, each of you really think of the Disney spin on Star Wars? Oh, sweet Jesus. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> let's, let, let's offend some people. You know, Come on. And <laughs> well, I let's start with John since yeah. he's uh, the most dead soul to the whole Disney yeah. thing. Um, I absolutely hate it. Um, I don't like the, uh, the the Mickey assembly line of let's pump one of these out per year, whether there is a reason for them or not. And say what you want about George Lucas's prequels, and I'll say that they're terrible. But at least they came from George Lucas, and now it's like I'm going to hand this property over, and we'll just. You know, filmmaking, running, you know, running gun, hired by whoever, and we'll make one of these every year until you can't digest it any longer. And it's it's assembly line filmmaking, and I'm I'm willing to give them each a shot. Like I'm not saying that I I won't see them or I won't be entertained by them, but I I just think it's shameless. For me, I have been a Star Wars nerd. Uh, for a very long time, not nearly as long as, as Lane has, uh, that's, that's all her, but, uh, <laughs> I, I actually don't mind the, uh, the, the, the pre, the, the sequel trilogies they've been moving. So force awakens and, uh, you know, uh, last Jedi, I didn't mind them. Um, I definitely had a bad taste in my mouth from the prequels. Like there was the biggest letdown for me. So, uh, seeing something different is nice. Um, I know I don't really care for Rogue One, um, and I don't really care for the Solo movie, uh, but I do love the Star Wars Rebels that just wrapped up. I thought that was a great series. So, I mean, I was about to ask you about that one. It was a mis- mixed bag for me. You know, it's hit or miss. Um, I'm kind of in the minority of a lot of people because it seems to be the consensus amongst major Star Wars nerds is that, you know, Last Jedi was an abomination. Um, me, I actually appreciated it a lot. I thought it was very different. And I think it's something, uh, interesting to see when your heroes fail, which usually Star Wars doesn't have that. So that's just me. But Lane, you want to? Yeah. I mean, like I, I kind of come from a, sa- a similar place. Uh, for me, you know, uh, Star Wars used to remind me of childhood and why I wanted to be a writer and a filmmaker in the first place. So, I mean, I'm just that poor soccer man. Like they throw these things out there and I'm like, Ooh, maybe it'll be good and then like now it's just been kind of like finding the gems in a string of garbage i mean you know rogue one was terrible but i loved force awakens like brian i also loved rebels i think they've done an amazing job with that show but you know i i also think solo looks like it's going to be a dumpster fire you know so it's it's a mixed bag. But the one thing I'll say about Last Jedi, you know, kind of in the line of what Brian was saying is like, I kind of liked that They were like, hey, well, you nerds with your stupid theories and like your, you know, Ray is a Skywalker or Kenobi bullshit. Guess what? She's nobody, bitch. Like, I really liked that. Suck you know, mouse balls. it was a little <laughs> bit more, you know, it, it did kind of have like a, a self-awareness of its own position in popular culture. And I kind of like that, you know, that they kind of went against the expectations there. But again, like when they needed to save the solo movie, they just picked Ron Howard to direct like how fantastically boring guys, you know. So, like I said, I just keep getting my heart broken by the crappy stuff and taking the good stuff where I can, you know. Lynn, they needed a man who wasn't going to miss sunlight. 
<laughs> I swear when they said uh, when they said Ron Howard's gonna direct the, the solo movie, I was like, oh, we're gonna have Tom Hanks as Han Solo. <laughs> right? That would have made it so much better. Why didn't they do that? Let's pitch this. Young Han Solo, a sixty-eight-year-old man. <laughs> so wait, we got a problem. <laughs> You know, Hollywood magic. <laughs> That's right. But only if he played Forrest Gump as Han Solo. <laughs> <laughs> and then it would be the perfect movie. If you combine Forrest Gump and Star Wars, man, it's all right there. Yeah, somebody who just accidentally, like, is a part of all the famous things of these movies, you know? <laughs> but I was on a Death Star. <laughs> my name, my ship, the most beautiful name I could. I was going to go with Millennium Falcon, but I just called it Jenny. <laughs> Oh, Salacious Trump is Jenny. Salacious right? Trump is Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> and then the Wookiee is, nah, that's stupid, bro. We got to name the Millennium Falcon, and that's why it's stuck. <laughs> In subtitles, of course. Hey, you got Bubba yeah. as Lando Calrissian. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wait, is he still alive? <laughs> I don't know. That's a good question. Billy D. Billy D. Billy yeah, he's still alive. He's still alive. Oh, I don't okay. know about the guy who played Baba, but Billy D. still alive. Oh no, the guy who played Baba was just in Fences, actually. Oh really? Oh yeah, nice. yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, oh. I, you know, we didn't get to see that one. We actually reviewed the trailer for that. Did you guys see that? Yeah. Fences? Yeah, it was boring. Okay. <laughs> well, it, was a, it was a fairly good movie. I mean, August Wilson by nature is a little bloated, but I'm, um, but obviously. Uh, very well scripted, as you know, because it's from August Wilson. But yeah, a little bloated, but very um, good art film. Yeah, I like that it was filmed in Pittsburgh too, since that's August Wilson's. Role. I just, I just felt it was a play. Like it was, it was well, literally it like. I know it is a play, but I'm just <laughs> saying, like, I want to see a movie. I don't necessarily want to see a filmed play. Oh well, yeah, which is kind of what it was. I, and I, that, I that's that that's my contention of it. That's true. Yeah, I, I could see that. You know, it's it's uh it's cherry picking the low hanging fruit instead of actually trying to come up with something like that's the thing that I actually felt like with Black Panther. I've I've actually heard a few people saying like, well, they should keep politics out of things. But I was like, uh, actually, I loved how they handled kind of the elephant in the room. They didn't make it about black versus white or some kind of crazy political thing. They just kind of addressed it as this kind of stuff is going on in the world has happened in the world. Where does Wakanda stand in the middle of all that? And, you know, and, and they kind of contrasted the extreme of guy that's full of rage and hatred and anger and wants to get revenge and the guy that's just trying to, you know, take care of his own nation, his own people and starts to take a greater responsibility in the international scene. Anyone who says um, keep the politics or whatever that's going on in reality out of my art doesn't understand what art is um <laughs> art be it music you know literature filmmaking tv it is a reflection of our society so if our society sucks it's going to show up in our art there's nothing you can do about that except maybe maybe fix the problems in our society so it doesn't show up in our art well filmmaking is not a reflection of reality but a reality of reflection ah oh, boom <laughs> oh, wow. We just got really metaphysical here. <laughs> Using that MFA to its full extent, huh? <laughs> so, guys, here's another interesting inflammatory question. What is the, for each of you, or for all of you together, what would be the most controversial stance you guys have about recent movies or about movies from the past? Like something that you know you're, you're way out there in left field compared to what most people think. Ooh. Oh, I don't man. really like aliens. I like Alien, but I don't like aliens. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Pants, but I told him that one. Um, let me think about a few more. Oh, well, I don't know. I mean, that's that's a tough one. Uh, I think Christopher Nolan is probably the most overrated filmmaker of his generation. Um, just trying to think of a couple more hot beats. Uh, we loved Last Action Hero. Yes. That, that was that's one. That's an unpopular That's an unpopular one. one. <laughs> Not one that I share. Hey, but. No, I know. But we love Black's action hero. We also love The Room, but I think a lot of people now kind of yeah, like The yeah. Room. Yeah. You know. Oh, I, I like Ghostbusters. I love Last Action, Last action Hero myself, so. The You're what? I love I, that movie as well. As well. Yeah, good. Yeah. They like us. They like Last too. Action Hero, too. 
great answers though especially the the first one that, that caught me off guard you, you like alien but not aliens what's the uh what's what's the reasons behind that you know this is probably unfair because i because alien came first i saw it as a horror movie and not an action movie and as much as i do love cameron um i just thought the movie was just scenery and it was well, what if we took all the things that looked neat and instead of making it like thoughtful, we just had like really cool looking guns and the aliens looked really cool and they climbed walls and went through vents. And well, don't worry, uh, Ripley will um, have a kid in the movie because she lost her kid and, and you'll have like all the feels because you're eight, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I don't know. I just thought it was um, a little overproduced and just kind of forgettable outside of just the visuals that you got in the first movie anyways. Well, didn't you say like they took, uh, like they wrote aliens, like the producer. Oh like, yeah. Here's an interesting this is, story. This is a great story. Uh, James Cameron actually, here's how he pitched this movie. He went into a room full of executives and there was actually a chalkboard. Cause you know, there's a chalkboard for some reason. And he wrote alien. Then he paused and looked at them, turned around, wrote an S turned around, paused, looked at them then put a dollar sign through the S, dropped the chalk, and left. And they financed the movie for $40 million. <laughs> wow. Whoa. That's some rock star shit right there. Damn. <laughs> oh, I have a good one. Um, I hated La La Land. Really? Yeah, I thought it was Yeah, stupid. we didn't really care for La La Land. Um, I thought it was self-indulgent. I thought it spoke to absolutely no higher truths about life or art. And um, yeah, I thought it was 100% overrated. Damn, no, that, that that's a good tagline right there. <laughs> I mean, it was it was basically a Hollywood circle jerk. I mean, that's that's honestly what it was. Well, there's also movies that you just don't get, and like you're not saying they're bad, but you don't get. Mine is No Country for Old Men, and God damn, have I tried? I've Dude. seen it like five times, and I'm like, <laughs> I I want to love this movie. Everybody tells me it's fantastic, but I. Yeah, oh, I don't get it, dude. Mine for that is Pulp Fiction. I've seen that movie like seven, Sh- seven, seven Shut times. Up. Like, don't I don't get that. it. Shut I, up. <laughs> hey, they want controversy. I'm giving them the scoop, man. That, and that, that, I and I. I hey, hey don't say nothing bad about Pulp Fiction. That was a great movie. <laughs> I love but, that movie. But that's, I'm not saying anything bad. But just to John's point, like I don't get it, and I tried really hard. I tried really hard, but I don't get it. I respect its place. I respect, you know. The, the artistry that went into it, but I don't get it. Oh, Matrix, Fight Club, Hocus Pocus, and a Hulk can all suck my ass. <laughs> 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 Overrated and horrible. Donnie Darko can suck my ass, too. <laughs> wow, you were just <laughs> shitting on everything. We just, we just lit, lit the powder <laughs> keg here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Wes Anderson, I kind of think he's overrated, too. 90% of Gus Van Sant can suck my ass. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> oh. There's not enough of John's ass for all these <laughs> <laughs> Go around. You're Sorry, good. it's all coming out now. <laughs> what, See what you've what, done? What, what, I ate some Chipotle and it's coming out now. <laughs> Hopefully you got enough for everybody. <laughs> wow. <laughs> this, this is great. So, uh, for, so for you guys uh, being more on the indie side of things and doing your own thing, I know that that means you are more into the art of it. You're more into kind of what it's really about. And I've, from, you know, the opinions I've heard from you so far, you guys definitely have your own individual takes on things instead of just the, what the pop culture feel is about all that stuff out there. So for you guys, I think because you are cinema freaks you are all into this stuff all the way you are the cinema psychos so what is your guys take on like hollywood and what's going on right now with movies not necessarily the political situation but just kind of with with the box office hits we've been having and some of the things that have just been bombing out do you guys think there's a lot of politics involved with this stuff well, Lane and I will just sit quietly for a second while we let Brian get this out of his system, and then we will chime in. <laughs> where, do you, where do you want me to start? Um, <laughs> I, I think that um, we have lost all originality from the studio system. There's, it's, it's all gone. There's, it's, it's done. Um, if you want originality, it's not in film. It is in Netflix. It is in web series. It is in uh, you mean like theatrical. Hollywood. Yeah, I mean theatrical Hollywood. Everybody. That's that's what I mean by it. It's it's not there. 
Um, I like to point to Stranger Things as a good example of this. If Netflix didn't exist, if uh, Amazon didn't exist, if Hulu didn't exist, um, I can guarantee you that Stranger Things would never have gotten off the ground. Um, it is way too original. It, it is derivative of, of a lot of 80s nostalgia, but it does have its own story. It does have its own thing. So if you told uh, me maybe 10, 15 years ago that there was going to be a big series that was only going to be on uh, a streaming service. It's not going to be on main cable. It's not going to be on network television. And it's going to basically be about kids going after a monster. Um, I would say, and you're going to say that's going to be gigantic. It's going to become a cultural phenomenon. I would say you're full of shit because that's not, that thing wouldn't be made. So, I mean, Hollywood thinks that they know what we want, but after so many bombs, like, I mean, we were talking about Black Panther and how it's now, you know, making, what was it, a, a billion dollars? Across yeah, it's a billion, billion dollars. And, you know, it wasn't too long ago that, you know, Hollywood executives were saying, oh, well, we can't have an African-American superhero or it won't oh, play in China or, or yeah, it won't play in China or we can't have a female led superhero movie because the only people who like superheroes are men. So don't get your hopes up for a Wonder Woman movie because it's just not going to work. Um, <laughs> that was complete bullshit, right? Like that didn't work. Um, and now they're, they're poised to do a Black Widow movie after, you know, they're now eating crow because they're seeing what's what Wonder Woman did and what Black Panther is doing. So I, I think that uh, Hollywood uh, should get their head out of their ass. That's my opinion. Oh, but. I, I think a big problem is that they don't know how to market film anymore. Uh, I've, I've read a lot of articles on this where, you know. Back in the studio days, like in the 50s, if you put a certain actor in a movie, it was going to be successful. If Cary Grant's in it, you know you're going to be successful. Uh, and then there was a point where if it was genre, you know, in the 80s, if you make an action movie, it's going to be successful. So there used to be, OK, it's genre, it's actor, it's, uh, you know, whatever the situation may be. Now they've run out of ways of determining what's going to make a successful movie any longer unless it's a Marvel movie or a Star Wars movie. And who God only knows how long before those kind of disappear. But the reason that we get so many remakes, reboots, soft reboots, soft sequel boots, whatever you want to call it, uh, movies based on old TV shows, whatever, is because they don't have any way of guaranteeing the success of what they would call, quote unquote, an original idea any longer. So they just look at what was successful before and then let's reboot it, refresh it, remake it, uh, restart it, because uh, they don't have any other way of determining what's going to be su a success any longer. Yeah, so they don't want to actually uh, – it sounds more like they don't want to take a risk on anything. I mean, I have a way more positive, uh, optimistic <laughs> look than these gentlemen here. I I think the fact, you know, like Brian said, you know, that streaming is so popular and the content is so rich. I think that's a great thing. I think that this took Hollywood by surprise and they were back on their heels a little bit about it. But I think what we're going to see is better storytelling moving forward because it's clear that that's what makes money. I mean, we just talked about Black Panther. It's crossed a billion dollars that that's a good movie like it's it's popular and it's it's been really making money for a lot of reasons but at its core it was well written it was well produced it was well directed and i think audiences respond to that more than anyone's giving them credit for if you tell a good story people are going to go see your movie i mean we saw that with get out last year you know jordan peele just won the oscar for that screenplay you know uh, word of mouth is still working for these sorts of things and i think if the content is is really high quality people will come out and see it you know i mean that's what we saw with um with get out i mean they made it for 4.5 million and they made all their money back and then some because it was good and people told their friends, oh, my God, you got to see this movie, you know? Mm -hmm. Lane, I'm going to disagree with you on that one. I think that that Get Out happened to hit kind of a zeitgeist, but you look at something like Annihilation and they say, oh, well, female-led movies are going to be very successful now and science fiction movies are going to be successful. And they've basically taken a bath on that one. Nobody yeah. is going to see it. Well, I heard it wasn't that well written and I heard it had some structure problems in the story. I'm saying that the content is dictating that now. Mm -hmm. If the content's good, then everything else that's working for a movie is going to continue working for it. Yeah, I'll, I'll take your point on that, Lane. I, I definitely see where I think um, before 
you know, internet has changed everything. Streaming services, having you know, just the capacity oh. in YouTube, you know, fan, fan videos, and and the the a broader spread of exposure to indie filmmaking. You know, it's it's changed a lot. So we have a a, a wider palette to choose from. We have more than just the Disney factory produced films, and that's that's I think created an atmosphere where people are craving better quality content because when they can eat McDonald's or they can eat at some local restaurant that has like amazing food, once they get over the initial risk of, do I really want to try this place I haven't been to before? Or do I want to just go by the old standby? Once they overcome that and people are say, you know, in this analogy, putting up reviews and saying, Hey, this place is really good up on Google. And they're like, Oh, okay, I'll try it. Then people get an appetite for quality. Totally. I totally agree. And I think that's changed the whole factor, too, in virality. Like, that's, you know, the, the science of virality is that we don't know what makes a video go viral. We don't really know. It, you know, in some, some cases, it is quality. In other cases, it's just why it's so terrible that everybody shared it around. Or it's just completely off the wall. <laughs> or it's, it's off the wall, you know, whatever. But what I do see that makes, I think, to me, the golden standard and what's really lasting it is the quality because what is it that we see that's lasted for generations and generations? We're still going back and watching that movie or watching that TV series. It's, it's the things that really had innovation at the heart of it and had really rich writing and story. Just like you're saying those are the things that stand the test of the ages. Agreed. Definitely. Okay. So, uh, moving on from all that, <laughs> we'll try to get into something a little more frivolous here. <laughs> <laughs> If any of you could be an animal, what would your spirit animal be? Oh, oh that's a I'd tough one. Maybe a goat because they just eat all the time and can eat anything. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> uh, have you ever seen the amount of ejaculate that a turtle produces? <laughs> <laughs> it's like someone knocked over a gallon of milk. It's... <laughs> and... Their O face is hysterical, so maybe I'd be a snapping turtle. I don't know. I mean, you could be some genetic hybrid between a goat and a snapping turtle if you want. Oh that my god! That doesn't sound terrifying. <laughs> First pitch for Secret of the Ooze. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit! Oh. Um, for me, I'm I'm a simple man, so <laughs> I am a massive Batman fan. So I got to go with a bat. That's it's original. A, it's very rich. You want to be blind during the day? <laughs> no, I want quick blood. Okay, that's what I want to do. <laughs> uh, mine is hands down a, a dark unicorn because they're magical AF, but they still got that stabby horn, yo. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Playing off of that, what did you think of Lauren Foss's take on My Little Pony? Oh, um, the, um, the show, um, this is so embarrassing, but I do watch it. <laughs> um, I, um, I think it, I think they've done a good job. Um, I was a little disappointed in the movie. I feel like they just didn't have quite the content that would have made, um, you know, a, a, a real difference. But what I particularly like is, um, I'm always looking at those sorts of things for content for young people. And I like that it's a world where, uh, you have female characters building each other up and supporting each other and uh, working through really tricky social situations with, uh, with, you know, with dignity and respect for others. And um, I, um, they, they get really high scores too, um, you know, in vocabulary considerations because of the, um, the, the language and like the dialogue that's used. So um, I think it's actually really good for kids. I, I was really skeptical when they rebooted it, you know, God, now it's been on the air for a long time, but when they first came up, you know, with the whole idea and how the animation was going to be totally different, I was super skeptical, but I actually think like they've done a fantastic job. Like I said, the, the movie was kind of disappointing. I didn't think that it was a big enough story for theater release, but I, I've been, I've been real happy with what they've done so far and especially how that translates to young women. Um, that was part of what I studied for my thesis was the American female coming of age. So I'm always looking at that content, seeing if it's positive for young people, you know, especially young women. So that's great. I'm, I'm going to preface this by saying, you know, I do have little sisters. I come from a big family, so I get exposure to things that ordinarily a, a single guy my age would never be watching, would never be Bro, caught dead watching. It's all right, man. <laughs> <laughs> just don't Sean, judge. We're all Sean, friends just here. Hey, Rainbow Dash is kind of hot. 
Hey, yeah. <laughs> hey, wow. hey, some of those ponies, man. <laughs> Sean just has to admit he's a brony, okay? It's all no, listen. fuck you guys. <laughs> fuck <laughs> you guys. But honestly, I, I agree with you that the, the writing is actually really good. I mean, Lauren, Lauren Foss, with her you know experience and what she did with Powerpuff Girls and with the other things that, that she's been involved in, I mean, she's she's a great writer and a great producer. And yeah, I I agree. And I really felt like a lot of the the stuff that they have in there, they, they it's kind of '90s esque, where they bring that that cross section between what's really just for kids, but there's also some smarter humor and some smarter concepts brought in there that you catch when you're an adult. Not anything yeah. inappropriate, mind you, but just you it's know so stuff that you know kids wouldn't normally get. But it just flows together so well. And two, the puns are so on point. Like every time they come up with a new way to insert like pony or hoof into something, like it just delights me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree. I, I like that they take a lot of things that are kind of countercultural because some of those things have gone out of, you know, like, like for instance, people are always like, excuse the pun. It's like, all right, we've had that long enough. Let's have puns again. Like puns have been <laughs> banished from society. Let them come back a little bit more. You know, it's okay. And, you know, some of the other stuff, like like you were mentioning, the positivity, you know, like even the title, the friendship, you know, the friendship is magic. That's like we've gotten so like everything's got to be dark and gritty and sinister. And I like dark and gritty and sinister, but I've gotten tired of it. Like it's everywhere and it's all the time. So like in a way they went over the top, made it like hyper positive, made it like hyper you know, happy and and wonderful and everybody's, you know, doing great, but added in the right mixture of like insanity into the characters yeah. that it just made it hilarious. And it's like, thank you. It's refreshing that you're teaching moral lessons that aren't boring me to death. Yeah, it's yeah. not as corny as some of the 90s stuff was either. Yeah, well, you remember in the 90s, they did the TV show thing with cartoons that was always like, okay, at the end, we have to have this little educational segment. And remember, kids, don't Something play with fire. <laughs> it's like yeah. what? Well, no, joke I, here about I learned a lot from GI Joe. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> don't touch that electrical wire. It's like, why are you under the lake right now? Well, you're swimming down here, you pervert. <laughs> yeah, and I think that children's programming is at its best when it's directional, but not preachy. And I think that a lot of '90s stuff fell into the preachy category, where you could see the lesson coming so hard, like it almost made you want to resist it, you know. But when it's more subtle, when it's more situational, and you can understand what's going at hand, you know, I think that that's just a credit to how good and subtle the writing can be to really get the lesson across without, you know, being too direct. And we joke now that everything gets a gritty reboot. It's a joke on this show where we, you we know, oh, the Shirley Temple gritty reboot. <laughs> <laughs> gritty reboot. Like Power Rangers did not need like a dark, like gritty reboot. It's a stupid movie for dumb children to sell dumb toys. And Krispy Kreme. <laughs> yeah, and Krispy Kreme. Oh. So they did not need their attempt at their gritty reboot of Power Rangers. Well, yeah, I, I would say the movie itself, yeah, didn't need that type of reboot, but that you, that independent YouTube uh, video that was circling around. Oh, oh that was really good. Yeah, I, I was kind of hoping that was going to be something actually authentic. And I'm like, that would be a really good movie, and it turned out not to be, but... Yeah, it seems none of those fan produced videos and movies and, and concepts. It's like they barely ever, like anything ever takes off the ground, which, you know, to me is kind of disappointing because it's like somebody out there, I don't know, Amazon, Netflix, somebody needs to start catching these things because some of these concepts that fans do come up with and actually go through the trouble of producing is better than anything you're going to see on the big screen. 2004 was Grayson? Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. yeah. They wanted to make a movie like where Batman was dead and Robin was. It was Bat in the Sun Productions. They yeah. did race it. And I just, like, yeah. that was back in the early days of YouTube, you know. Like, <laughs> that one, and I was like, wow, you know, somebody's going to pick this up. And yeah, nobody ever did. So, so uh, question industry related. What do you guys see as the future for indie filmmaking? Hmm. Uh, I think that the window being open now for, you know, Amazon instant video, um, you know, and, th and different ways to get your your stuff out there. You know, we were told when we went, you know, to film school um, in the early 2000s, well, you make a film and max out a bunch of credit cards on expensive film and then you shop it off to a 300 
you know, film festivals. And you're like, well, then what happens? Well, probably nothing. And most of them will be showing it on a cement wall in a gymnasium somewhere. And, you know, maybe if you're really good at, you know, um, shaking hands and doing that stuff. And yeah, you're, you're maybe you'll make a connection at one of these film festivals. So not only do you have to have thousands of dollars to go to them, but you also have to or to pay to get in and hope you get in. But then you also have to go there and, you know, hobnob until maybe, maybe you have some level of success. But now, thankfully, the doors are a little bit more open for independent filmmaking where you can put your independent films on Amazon Instant Video. So not only do you have now the ability for anybody who wants to see your work can go see it, but, you know, if you're successful enough, you might even make a little bit of money off of it. At least, if nothing else, recoup the cost of making making the film. So. I, I mean, for me... Um... I, I I definitely agree with with John. I think streaming is is really the future. Um, but at the same time, I think there's a danger in it because the uh, the big dogs, the Hollywood studios, uh, they know what the game is. Um, I know recently um, I, I'd followed a couple filmmakers who complained about the fact that uh, Amazon Video Direct, which is the primary service that independent filmmakers use to to get their videos out there, because it it connects directly to prime um, that a lot of them have been blindsided by the fact that uh, Amazon reduced the amount of money that they're paying out to these, these smaller filmmakers um, started, I think it was starting this year where they reduced the amount from, I think it was originally like 10 cents or six cents uh, a minute the, to that stream to now it's down to like two or three. So they're doing that while at the same time courting the big studios to produce these, you know, larger than life, you know, programming, which the programming that they're making is extremely original. But I think it's also, you know, it's it's screwing over the the little guys who kind of made Amazon Video Direct and made Prime what it is. You know, so I think there's it's a double edged sword. It's it's do you do you let the streaming, you know, uh, technology go to the the big studios that have you know monopolized everything, or do you make it so that it's still open and still uh, you know gives independent filmmakers uh, a, a revenue stream? Yeah, and um, I would agree with the guys in saying that uh, the streaming services are a huge game changer. You know, particularly um, Amazon, even despite the uh, the the pay cut cut that they have um, implemented just because um, things with YouTube kind of get murky now with like having your rights to the project or YouTube taking your rights and that sort of thing. But um, one of the things that, is interesting is that streaming is so accessible. I mean, as long as you have all the episodes of a season or, or you have your film or whatever, it's really not hard to get it on there. You just have to close caption it and, um, and then submit it. So I, the idea is that like literally anybody can do this. So how do we dictate the content? You know, how, how does a, a community decide, you know, oh, well, this is good indie, but this is bad indie. So it, it kind of becomes a question of, of flooding the space with so much content. How do we determine, you know, what's what's worth a second look and what's not, you know? Right. The problem of the Internet, basically. <laughs> everything yeah, everything all summed up in one. It's true. <laughs> well, I guess that just still comes down to views, though. I mean, if, if it's good, are you going to watch it a second time, a third time? And... Each one of those views adds up. As a community, I guess that's more how we would do it. But at the same time... But it's it, also a bigger community yeah. because of the fact that, you know, the internet reaches the world. Like a Zulu warrior can actually get on his freaking cell phone, use a 3G network, and watch the short video you made on YouTube. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's changed a lot. You know, there's a bigger pool of an audience than there's ever been before. But, like, a lot of things I hear you guys talking about here is the question is... How centralized does the streaming become? And mm -hmm. that, that and how do you cut through everything? Like, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but, you know, with, with podcasting, you know, you guys know that if you're not in new and noteworthy or if you don't get featured or anything like that, it's somewhat difficult for, for people to, to find your, your, your shows or anything like that. Um, you know, through uh, the centralized hub that is, that is iTunes and Apple Podcasts. So I think it's the same thing with filmmaking. You know, it's the same thing with Amazon Prime is, you know, how are you cutting through everybody? Cause everybody thinks they're a filmmaker because they can use their phone and shoot a movie. So it's how do you cut through all that? 
you have something that sticks out enough, I guess, more that brings in the views. Well, it's it's a it's a complex combination of things because you do have to stick out, but you also have to position yourself to the right audience and the right people. Yeah. And then a lot of it's luck too, and a lot of it, like they said, is actually producing enough content that something catches with somebody. So it translates to a lot more time and a lot more effort and putting yourself out there, but at least you get a shot now. Whereas before, right. like you guys were saying, it was all just kind of stuck with the Hollywood machinery. And the nice thing for fans is if you buy a ticket to a movie and it sucks and it's Saturday night, you blew $16 on a piece of shit. <laughs> if you're watching something on YouTube or Amazon or Hulu and it sucks, you can just pick something else, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and if it's great, you could get involved and get perks for getting it financed and seeing a bigger production off of it. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, notice that y'all are filmmakers. What films have y'all done? It's, Who wants well, to go first? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's a lot of, I would say freelance work that the three of us do you know so it's um you know we got to pay the bills as much as you know we can work on our own stuff so i could throw out a lot of short films and um one feature documentary that i've done but you probably will never heard of them i mean they're they're on the internet but um yeah it's a lot of doing like um you know uh, music videos industrial videos wedding videos the brian hates wedding videos i despise them um (laughs) but you know it's yeah, it's something that allows you to do something creative in the field, but also then get paid. And then um, if you have a little bit of extra money coming in, then you can actually work on things that uh, that make you happy. And right now, obviously, zero content because I'm in the process of writing it. But come September, I am looking to launch a YouTube channel, which you know, I know we just kind of crapped on a little bit. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> come September 1st, I'm looking to launch with a, about uh, hopefully uh, four to four to six episodes and then um, one coming out every week from there. For 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 me, I mean, I, uh, I, I I've done a, a feature length documentary about burlesque and sideshow in Pittsburgh. Uh, that was a couple of years ago. I just recently did uh, uh, a number of like social media short films for a band in town called uh, Venus and Furs. Um, so I mean, really, just small things. Uh, I you know, just smaller short films, that sort of thing. Mainly because, you know, as John said, we got to pay the bills. So we all have day jobs, unfortunately, that, that aren't necessarily in the industry as, you know, so, I mean, that sort of thing. Prior to that, the, the day job I had, I mean, I, I'd done some freelancing on some, some, you know, mid, mid range sized, uh, productions that came through town. So that sort of thing. Yeah, and for me, I had mentioned my thesis earlier, um, and the so the document of the thesis, like that really long paper you have to write, um, that was the um, on the American female coming of age. And then for the film itself, I did a, a documentary about um, eating disorders and uh, technology and how the media can play into that as well. And that was actually um, sponsored by the National Organization for Women and uh, screened a few times. Wow, that's impressive. I was very lucky, you know, I had great connections and um, I was I was actually very humbled that they had wanted to work with me. I'm sure it was great. I mean, you definitely seem really smart. You seem to know a lot about what's really going on and what needs to be addressed. And I think, uh, you know, I, I bet they just chose the right person. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. <laughs> now that we're done kissing ass. Any other <laughs> questions, guys? <laughs> Don't give her an ego. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, this, this is this is a destabilization technique, you know, or this is a hostile takeover. <laughs> like we're having a pump and just blowing the head up real quick. You know? <laughs> I know Sean went on with the spiritual animal earlier with your spiritual animal. I'm going to go into the movies. What movie character best represents you? Oh, man. Well, they, uh, <laughs> they, Facebook did something like this. Like, what three characters define you? Blah, blah, blah. Um, now, you know, this is a little bit of TV, but I picked Bart Simpson, Mike Nelson from Mystery Science Theater, and Ace Ventura, and I, I thought I thought I nailed it. <laughs> I think you did completely nail it. Yeah, I, I'll go with that one too. Um, like that same example. Um, and they were um one movie character and two uh, TV characters. I would say uh, Jane Lane from Daria, Veronica Mars, and uh, Hermione Granger. I'll just go with one movie character because I can't think of any TV people right now. But um, I ha- I really like Ash from The Evil Dead. So. <laughs> <laughs> I- I'm going to go with Ash. I mean, come on. If you're going to be anyone, you want to be Ash Williams. I mean, come on. Groovy, maybe. Groovy. <laughs> you have the one-liners all the time. Damn right. <laughs> Get that chin. 
in that chin. <laughs> yes. I don't think I've seen Brian's chin in like three years. I've never. I haven't seen my chin in like over twenty. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> they went pretty quick with that one. Yeah, that was, <laughs> boom, 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 oh, you were stalling. That was a stalling mm-hmm. question. Okay. <laughs> Not a Stalin question, a stalling mm-hmm. question. There's a difference. <laughs> Let me tell you a thing or nine about Joseph Stalin. I'm glad you had yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I got a question now. So, like, how uh, you guys have done, what, almost 100 episodes? Yeah, we're coming Damn up close. on Damn it. Damn close, yeah. yeah. Uh, for each one of you, what is your favorite episode that you guys have recorded? Not to dodge it a little bit, but I think that I have a particular type of episode that I think I prefer more, and that's our filmmaker retrospective, which actually is a newer episode that we do where we pick um, you know, filmmakers that are popular, I think, just as much for being themselves as they are you know, for their films. We've done Quentin Tarantino, Tim Burton. Uh, we just did Kevin Smith, and I, I think that those episodes are – really very um debate heavy in like a good way where we kind of break down you know where the filmmaker was historically what the merits of our other films like you know did they peak did they do this did they do that and and it's it's very much a uh, textural film breakdown so i would say that type of episode is actually my favorite i mean for me it's a it's a toss-up um mainly because uh you know they're, they're both basically tied to the same uh, movie, but uh, I love our, our pantheon of utter shit on the room. I think it's one of our best episodes we've done. Um, but then there's also, you know, we did a, an interview with the, the director of room full of spoons recently in December. And he was able to kind of, you know, tell us all the backstory. Cause he personally was friends with Tommy Wiseau and then got sued by him. Uh, because of his documentary, and it was it was like holy crap, he's he get divulging all the stuff, and it was just very insightful to see as filmmakers what you're actually going through um, when you want to make a movie and and some of the pitfalls of it. I would say um, my favorite episode is the interview we did with uh, filmmaker Len Kapazinski. Um, if you guys Google him, um, he's done some stuff with Red Letter Media. Um, he's a filmmaker here in Pennsylvania. He's about two hours from where we live. And um, John and I actually edited a film for him in 09. And uh, that's how we knew him. So um, we had him on the show. And, um, you know, he's just he's just a really cool guy. Like, he knows so much about he is, I mean, he has an encyclopedic knowledge of kung fu movies. He knows all about bad movies. He, I mean, he, he'll always have like a recommendation. It's actually part of his Patreon where he'll have like, l- like Lens Film Den and he'll have like a recommendation for people. He recommended a few to us that were like absolute gold, you know. Um, but it just was cool to talk about indie filmmaking with him because it's such a, a similar foothold to what we have. You know, we have the resources of, you know, uh, a state that has four seasons and sometimes that's an asset and sometimes you have to work around it. And, you know, just talking about like the longstanding relationships and resources you build up over time as a filmmaker, like, Oh yeah, I have a friend in a funeral home. That's really helpful. Or I have a friend who's awesome at scouting locations, you know, like, I have a great friend who's a really good actor. You know, we, we all have those things that, you know, we start to put in our arsenal and to talk with Len about that. Um, you know, we had such a great conversation with him on our show. And then a few weeks later, he asked us to interview him again for the re-release of one of his films uh, for the DVD. So um, for Fist of the Vampire, one of his early films, he re re-released it once he um once the rights diverted back to him and so we're on like the dvd special like the yep. bonus features for his dvds nice um, so yeah now that that's one of my absolute favorite episodes just because it was such a great conversation you know len tells amazing stories about being on set and you know it was just such a good time that sounds fantastic now playing off of that for each one of you who is your favorite director oh Boy, uh, <laughs> dun, dun, dun. see, we're, 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 we're going to take it hardball now. You know, we've been going easy on you. Well, he's kind of turned into a shit wagon of a human being, I'd say, in the last five years. <laughs> and he hasn't, like most directors, when they get older, because we um, we've debated this quite often, that filmmaking, uh, especially directing, is a young man's game. And eventually filmmakers reach an age where they should just go water the flowers. And unfortunately, he's gotten there now. But uh, probably my favorite filmmaker is Oliver Stone. Um, but you know, he hasn't, you know, 
since any given Sunday hasn't made anything really all that great, uh, which was the late 90s, which is sad to say. But, uh, you know, his early work to me, um, I'm also, you know, a big student of history and his films are almost kind of a um, with a slant. But, you know, a artistic look back on the 20th century, um, you know, so between Platoon, uh, Talk Radio, JFK, which, you know, you can love or hate depending on how you feel about the, um, you know, whether there was a conspiracy or not. But you can't overlook the mastery of the filmmaking of the film if you can get past the politics of it. Um, Born on the Fourth of July. For me, it's it's probably uh, Oliver Stone. Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, it's it it's a it's kind of a split. Um, I got into filmmaking kind of decided I, this is what I wanted to do uh, because I was a, a big fan of uh, Clive Barker's work. Um, I love Hellraiser, the Hellraiser series, with the exception of, you know, everything past uh, Hellraiser four. Um, but, uh, I, I love his storytelling ability. I love, uh, you know, his movies that he's done and, and his writings as well. Um, the other one is, you know, I'm, I, I live in Pittsburgh, so you can't really, you know, not mention, uh, George Romero, uh, from, from, a an a, a aspect of a, a filmmaker who had nothing and was in Pittsburgh and was able to create a cultural phenomenon that basically changed the face of, of the genre. You know, you have to go with George Romero. So uh, this, for me, recently changed when we found out that he was also a total shitbag of a human being. Um, <laughs> used to really like Joss Whedon until I knew he was a cheating piece of shit. Um, because, uh, you know, growing up uh, in high school, uh, you know, Buffy kind of coincided with my entire high school experience. It started when I was in seventh grade and then the show ended when I graduated high school. So it was like kind of this beautiful metaphor of like this show I loved about monsters while battling like the demons of puberty or whatever. Um so, uh, yeah, he was my favorite for a while. And now, um, you know, just with all the uh, the situation that came out with him, you know, serial cheating on his wife, it's it's hard to take a man who calls himself a feminist seriously when that's sort of how he treats women. Um, but um, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but actually, I think J.J. Abrams is one of my favorite directors, honestly. Um I for me, Fucking I've always magic box. I've always. <laughs> hey, look, they are not winners, but I've you know, I'm most interested in the long format, you know, more so than than just films. Um, I've always liked, you know, the series or, you know, it used to be called TV shows back in the day. <laughs> now we have <laughs> things and stranger things too and i don't You're know an old broad. i don't know what's going on but no i mean like you know i um if you want to talk about controversial opinions um i loved the show alias and i seem to be the only person on earth who did um but you know i think also abrams has done a lot of, of, of cool things on the big screen too you know i really liked super eight um even though it was a little schmaltzy and sentimental i really dug it but um you know, I also think he did a great job of Force Awakens. And, um, you know, and, and as I was like kind of thinking about your question too, like, I, you know, for me, like it always means a lot to to see women in the industry because that's very uncommon. Um, and it's just, it's funny though, because obviously I grew up in the eighties and nineties and, you know, there just aren't a lot of footholds for that, you know, as far as that goes, you know, cause I mean, you, you look at someone like Nora Ephron, who's been, you know, a huge part of the industry, but you know, when it comes down to the, to the films, I'm not as, you know, I'm not as fond of those, you know, so one more before we, you know, go ahead and wrap this up because we're getting over on our recording time and my production is going to get more and more lengthy as we continue this. <laughs> <laughs> you know how that multiplies and stacks. Yeah. But uh, what the last question for each of you, this is something we've started to kind of do every now and then on the show. What would be your 90s actor or actress crush? Oh, that's a good. Oh, question. man. Oh, man. Meryl Streep. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let me think about this. Oh, Topanga from Boy Meets World. Uh, yeah. yeah. Big ass titties. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I'll probably think of 10 here. Okay, I'm done. I'm ready. I, I'm going to okay. go. You're, you're uh, good. Do it. Okay. Yeah, no. James Marsters, or James Marsden, excuse me. I always get them confused because I'm a Buffy fan. Uh, James Marsden. Um, he was in a really shitty movie called Gossip with Kate Hudson and Norman Reedus and um, Lena Headey, who is on Game of Thrones. And uh, that that was like his big 90s moment. And then, of course, he did, you know, X-Men and stuff. But, man, 
Marsden then, Marsden now, like done. I like that you started with that, not just he Cyclops. <laughs> like the movie where I first fell in love, damn it. For for me, it's it's a it's a draw between uh Michelle Pfeiffer as Catwoman in Batman Returns and Elvira. Oh, double butter. Elvira is still on my top nicely done sir. ten list. Oh, sure. Stratus made is the reason a bunch of my tube socks can. Stand. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Damn. How do you quit blowing your nose in your bed sheets? <laughs> <laughs> are you Are you going to tell them about Mariah Carey? Are you going to? Oh yeah. Mariah What's Carey? this Mariah Carey thing? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That that lot of chunder thunder for uh, <laughs> for old Mariah. Good lord. Watch those videos on mute. <laughs> Yeah, they basically just build her as a prostitute. Like, if you watch the videos on mute, it's just ass tits, ass it. I'm not complaining. Like, I didn't know she could. I didn't know she had a voice for years. John's a big Mimi fan. <laughs> wow. Well, guys. Great- yeah, yeah, it was a lot of fun. We actually formulated that one. I don't know our our uh, main big Kahuna Kyle. He just kind of came up with it out of nowhere, and he was just like, "Hey, we're gonna do this now because we uh, we kind of make fun of ourselves a lot. We do a lot of uh, a lot of gay jokes, you know, throw around the <laughs> throw around that back and forth between us." And he was like, "You guys, not a, I don't believe a single one of you are straight anymore. We need to have something that's all about women with big titties in the nineties." <laughs> <We're like>, okay, <laughs> there were a lot. Of- big titties in the night <laughs> right right so yeah that that brought in a whole fun aspect but guys this has been a lot of fun we've enjoyed it i i personally because i do love you know the whole thing of of cinematography and what it is to be doing filmmaking and the indie scene i'm, I'm a big supporter of alternative entertainment not just the big centralized machine so major props to you guys and what you're doing and we definitely love to see it out there, see real artistry, still having a voice in the world. And uh, right now, we want to give you the opportunity that whatever, uh, if you want to throw some props out there to somebody, if you want to you know, give a shout out to anyone, you can, you can have at it. And also, just for yourselves, whatever you want to do, a quick promotional of you know, where people can find your stuff and you know, where, what, what, whatever you're up to, whatever special things you might have going on. I, I will start because I am furthest left <laughs> for no other reason. Um, well, I am. I'm launching the uh, the YouTube channel, which I have threatened a lot of times. I felt for the longest time like that guy's like, I'm writing a book. It's like, how's that book going, John? I got a title. Um, but I actually have a launch date now, and I've written about five or six episodes uh, up to this point. So I will have a YouTube channel uh, launching here September 1st. Um, it's gonna be the, the main show. I'm still working out some of the kinks, but um, uh, cynicism, but it's S I N E dash. Ah, see what I did there? Nice. Uh, <laughs> talking about a couple of different things. Um, uh, sh- you know, a show where I have a hundreds of questions because I, I think I have OCD about watching movies and I can't help but ask a million questions. And for the sanity of my wife, I'm gonna actually put it into show form. Um, Yay. And uh, the check-in, where go back to movies from like the 80s, 90s, 70s, and just see if they if they hold up or if there's something that's like oh. And finally, one that the deep show where I kind of talk about film topics like can you appreciate film from an artist that you know uh, has um, had a lot of scandal? Like, can you still appreciate the art outside of the artist? You know, topics like that. So those particular, those three particular shows starting September first, I'm going to try to get. Uh, an episode out a week plus the movie reviews so that's kind of um, where I'm at right now so keep an eye out for that you know just look John Wolscroft on YouTube after September and unless I'm a liar I should be there uh, I mean for me I don't I don't really have anything uh, of, of my own projects aside from the podcast really going on but uh, we've started a new uh, blog uh, thing that we're doing uh, on our website cinemapsychoshow.com uh, where once a week we uh, basically feature a horror film that can only be found on YouTube and it is only independent short films. So uh, the idea is that there it get, gets these filmmakers more press. It gets them, you know, more views to their work and just exposes them to, uh, you know, an audience that they might not might have trouble cutting through some of the uh, crap on YouTube. So uh, we did two so far. Um, and they get, I'll get a review too. So, 
Uh, we did one with um, a movie called Humbug. That's basically a, a really funny uh, female-led horror film of, with, with you know, one kind of Stepford wife type woman and one goth type woman. And it's about how Christmas and how this woman thinks that, you know, there's a humbug inside of this goth woman who is that's preventing them from uh, enjoying Christmas. So that was one we did. And then we just did one with a movie called Speechless uh, by filmmaker named Dustin Demerit, who uh, made this amazing short film that is truly terrifying. Um, and, and I definitely suggest that people check check out these filmmakers. I mean, it, I was blown away by them. So there's that. And then aside from the, like the the podcast, you know, people want to find the podcast. We're on iTunes, Stitcher, basically anywhere you can find a podcast. Spotify as well. Psycho Show. If you just go onto Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, type in Psycho Show. We're the first ones that pop up. Uh, like us, we have a newsletter called Psychos Nation, which once a month we uh, push out content, recaps of our episodes. Uh, previews of what we'll be doing the next month so just type in cinema psycho show on on google you'll find us we're the first ones up and then lane oh you like promoted the show and i'm gonna promote myself you can promote yourself <laughs> do it um so i um i'm also working on uh getting into uh book narration right now as the um audiobook narrator i am finishing up two books right now um uh one is a, a self-published novel and the other is um, a book from Hadley Real Press um, called Left Hand Gods. And um, so I'm looking to, you know, to kind of further in that area, I do have a profile on ACX, which is the um, audible cohort, I guess, for for that sort of thing. I'm there under my name, Lane Willis Croft, if anyone is looking for a book narrator. Um, and two, um, as far as science fiction and fantasy goes, I'm going to be at the um, Nebulas in May uh, to hopefully connect with more people and learn more about the, the narration and, and kind of kind of, you know, get more networking going through there. So awesome 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 you guys did great it sounded like you had this all rehearsed i mean be honest do you did you write this stuff down no no we didn't <laughs> people that talk a lot think fast talk fast <laughs> when you're 100 episodes in it just kind of rolls off the tongue <laughs> i got you i got you uh, it, was, it was nice having you all on the show no i'd like to have yeah, you on guys, again whenever we can yeah that was fun. Yeah, thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for your patience with our stumblings and bumblings. I don't know. I don't think any of us are awake or sober. I mean, there's something going on here. But- <laughs> <laughs> no worries. No worries. Yeah, this canned energy stuff ain't helping right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like they, they stopped putting whatever it was that used to be a monster that worked. Either that or maybe we're just getting too old, Josh. I don't know. <laughs> That's when you need to, like, start drinking balls and those other, like, off-brand energy drinks. That are- <laughs> well, I don't know. Those, those, those don't help. Don't help. Oh, compared to Red Bull and Rockstar. Oh. Yeah, man. Monster. All right, guys. Well, we'll let you go. But thank you again so much for your time tonight. We had a blast. Right, Thanks, thank guys. You. See you. See you. That was our interview with the Cinema Psycho Show, guys. It was a good interview we had with them. It was hilarious. All right, let's give a shout-out to all of our sponsors again. Here we go. We got Uncanny Comics, Joseph Kano here in Rosenberg, Texas, the guy that keeps us alive. <laughs> and then also we can – our radio people are – No Fucks Given Radio. Um, Beyond the Dawn. Beyond the Dawn Radio and Sling, Sling Flings. Flings Radio. And then also uh, we have our gentleman over at – Black Forest Comics. Uh, hopefully he'll get to be able to start helping us more. We're always promoting, but I think he changed his name and I forgot to get it from Miguel. Again, um, he's gone again. under the radar, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and then who else we got there? Oh, we got our partnerships also with Tokyo Munchies, uh, Virus Vodka, which I forgot to bring. Again. <laughs> again. <laughs> this, this, this mythological virus vodka that you speak of. Well, we drank most of it. So. <laughs> Speaking of virus vodka, when I do eventually get to building you a PC for video production, I'm going to make it liquid cooled. And there's a virus tubing that looks like uh, resident, the resident evil virus tubing. Nice. I'm, have, I'm definitely going to have to get that for you on that. Cause and we're going to just deck it out and make it, you know, virus vodka. <laughs> Go all the way. Yeah. Three oh, Time Out Entertainment also. Mm. Absolutely. Our friends over in Dallas and, uh, let's see, Matt, Matt, Matt and Dallas. Yeah, Matt and Dallas and Miguel and some of us may be featured every now and then on the show too. You know, we can all get out there, but yeah, they're going to be starting up. It's going to be all about sports. It's going to be politics, a, <laughs> everything, everything, but centered on sports. 
centered on, you know, some of the things that's going up there in Dallas because Matt's got some really great connections, but it's going to go even crazier than this show. You guys know that with this show, we try to avoid, uh, for the most part, religion and politics, but with that one, it's going to be no holds barred, like whatever the hell's going on. So if you're easily offended, which you probably aren't even listening to us, but just just as a, as a disclaimer from from Critical Thinking Podcast, our views may not be fully represented on, this, <laughs> on, on that show. show. <laughs> Uh, that that's our show for. Oh, we don't have any Twitter numbers or anything for you because Miguel's not here. Miguel died, you know Miguel. that. So hey, every Miguel. everything we do now is going to just be clipping different bits and pieces from audio that he said before. So <laughs> in hey, memory of Miguel, have, what Miguel have, would have said. We have the software. We can make it <laughs> anything. And then, oh, also uh, our our friend of the friend of the show, and we also interviewed him, Advent Comics. And I forgot to bring it, but he sent our T-shirts, and I got him at the house. Nice. Okay, so we will definitely be taking a picture with those, and because I I saw the one picture you did send me over the messenger, they look awesome. Well, I got I'm the only one that got a hoodie because that was the only one in my size. Oh, nice. We got Sean, Kyle, and and Miguel T-shirt. I got. I still say we should do the whole custom jersey thing like we were talking about previously. (laughs) Uh, Other than that, that is our show. Uh, Y'all have a great rest of the week. Hey guys, you can connect with us on iTunes at Critical Thinking Podcast and Twitter at Critic underscore Thinking and also on Facebook and Instagram at Critical Thinking Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, Critical Thinking is on Beyond the Dawn Radio, which is known for playing the best indie radio music around the world on Thursdays at 7 p.m. Pacific and 9 p.m. Central Time. And if you like the show, please five star the episode and tell your friends. So thank you for joining us, thinking shit through one podcast at a time. Thank you.